Associate Director of the Simons Institute. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Simons Institute, we are the international leading venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. And we bring together the world's leaders in theoretical computer science and related fields from all over the world and foster the next generation of young scholars. Um, we were established in 2012 with a generous gift from the Simons Foundation. And the primary aim of our programs is to explore algorithmic thinking and science and engineering, and also just to study the laws of computation itself. Um, so we're very grateful to the Simons Foundation for their ongoing support and to our highly valued industry partners, Algorand, Apple, Google, JP Morgan, NTT Research, Rock360 and VMware. And their support enables us to produce excellent programs like we're gonna have tonight. Um, also a big thank you to our donors in our first annual uh, financial campaign, which happened in December. And as mentioned in the appeal, uh, the Simons Foundation has generally offered to match gifts one-to-one. -one. And if you're interested in donating, feel free to reach out and contact me. So today's lecture is our Theoretically Speaking series, which highlights exciting advances in theory theoretical computer science for a general audience. Um, Wow, people are still filing in. And we're really excited to feature a lecture today by Po Shen Lo. So um, Po keeps a very active lecture schedule. I looked at his itinerary of where he's been recently and where he's going, and I was exhausted just reading the list. Um, he uh, indeed reaches over 10,000 people through his lectures uh, that he gives around the globe. Um, and his, the videos that he's either created or featured in have reached over 19 million views on the YouTube channel. So that's a lot. Um, so Poe's day job is a professor of mathematics at CMU. Um, he's also a math coach par excellence. So he, um, he led the CMU math team to their first uh, number one ranking among North American universities. He also uh, coaches the US math Olympiad team and led them to their first back-to-back -back victories in 2015 and 16, and then again, 18 and 19. So a lot of, um, a lot of victories there. Um, he's also an incredibly creative innovator in the realm of education and healthcare. Um, and he started out creating just a, a, an innovative learning pla platform, but it's grown well beyond that to all kinds of projects in social welfare and health. Um, Poe will do a much better job than I will do in describing those. So I'm gonna hand it over to him. And his talk today is about building human intelligence at scale to save the next generation from chat GPT. Thank you. Po. Yo. Hello everyone. Let me first check, is the, is the level of this, is the microphone on is the first question. Yes, yes. It's on, oh, well then you guys have wonderful acoustics in this room because I don't hear myself. So that, that's, you guys have good investments in this space. Uh, first of all, I think I should say, when I was told to come here, I was expecting a general audience. Uh, but I will say, looking at the audience, I see some people here, such as somebody who taught me when I was in school, who was my coach. <laughs> I, see, I see former students of mine, I see other esteemed professors. And now I'm slightly wondering exactly what general audience means at the <laughs> Science Institute, but that's okay. I, I, will, I will try to make this thing broad and hopefully interesting. Uh, we will not necessarily go into things that are too specialized, although because I see that there are people in this audience who might like geeking out over a few things, I might. Uh, geek out over a few things at times. Uh, actually, it's a real pleasure for me to be here in Berkeley giving a talk. I don't think I've ever given a talk in Berkeley before that was run by Berkeley, uh, but I was born right around here. So, so actually, this is, this is quite, quite fun to be here. My, my father was a PhD student in statistics, and he graduated in 1982. And so for me, Berkeley has always been a place that he said at some point, you should, you should go study there. Well, I didn't quite, but I'm happy to be here for, for this. Now, uh, I, I should also say that the, the objective of this talk, it's actually not around the computer science behind GPT. There are plenty of people in this room who know far more than I do about machine learning uh, and, and all of the artificial intelligence and everything. What I'm gonna be focusing on is what should we do next? Because I work with the next generation, I work with education, and in fact, even this morning, I was actually just at a middle school. In fact, what I, what I like to do, I travel around because I want to understand the problem 
One of the things I've learned when trying to solve real world problems is that real world problems involve real people. And the only way to understand how to solve real people's problems is to talk to real people. And so, for example, this morning I was down at the middle school, actually talking to sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, you name it, down in, uh, in, in the Silicon Valley side of the Bay. Now, for this, for this talk, I, I'm going to focus on education because I think the, the big thing that we're thinking about right now in education is actually GPT, chat GPT. So I'm going to dive right in and start outlining why we have a major problem. And of course, some of you, many of you may already know this, but the only way to know for sure is to go and start asking some questions. So I like to give talks live. Uh, there was a warning that popped up earlier when I opened this website saying that GPT is under a heavy load right now. So if, this, if the live part doesn't work, I'll just tell you what it usually says. Does that sound good? But this is at least supposed to be live. So I want to tell the story. And, and the story starts from why, why I started to worry about this. You see, at the beginning, I heard about this GPT thing. And I remember at the beginning, the beginning is November 2020 like last, last November, all of us mathematicians were busy mocking it, saying it can't do math. This is at least what I was seeing. People were all mocking it, saying it can't do math. But uh, it, was, it was clear that it could do some other things. For example, it could write college admission essays. Actually, that's the very first thing I ever asked GPT to do, because I was on a scholarship review committee inside my university. It was the, the Goldwater Scholarship Review Committee, if you know what I'm talking about. We were supposed to nominate some candidates for consideration for the national competition. And I warned my colleagues. I said, you know, there's this new GPT thing. It can write essays. So the very first thing I did is I asked it to write essays and discovered that it could. Actually, this is going to shake up the entire US higher education college application system. Uh, I, I, was at a, I was at a talk. I go to a lot of these, a lot of these places and, and give talks. So I was, at, I was at an event at Yale. There was a math competition at Yale. So I was, I was speaking about stuff to the parents. And then afterwards, a Yale admission officer came to, to tell us all to have our kids apply to Yale, which you know, we respect. It's, it's good. And, and the, the person gave some opportunity for us to ask questions. So the students all asked questions. And then finally, I wanted to ask my question, which was, uh, if you have chat GPT, how are you going to deal with college essays next year? The admission officer said, oh, ChatGPT can't write good essays. Please write a Yale admission essay. I like math. I also like computers. And I like hamburgers. <laughs> write with great passion. Not really fancy big words, but sound like I really am passionate about helping people <laughs> with hamburgers and math and computers. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. I have no idea what it's going to say. I just know it always say something reasonable. Okay, so it's not bad. It's not bad. And this was one of my first experiences that, oh, ChatGPT is going to shake up the US higher education industry for college admissions. That's interesting. <laughs> Actually, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Okay, by the way, uh, I mean, some of you might also work in the admission or adv advising on admission. And as far as I understand, one of the goals of the, of the essay was to make it so people can't apply to that many colleges. Actually, when I think about the, the purpose of each piece of the college admission, this, this helps to reduce the number of colleges people apply to. But uh, when you can generate the essay in five seconds, that's a different question. Uh, please, by the way, I know this is being recorded. So please, if you're watching this, I am not endorsing the use of ChatGPT for cheating on college applications. Uh, please do not do that. I, I, I'm saying this as a white hat hacker of saying this is, a, this is an exploit. So we need to rethink what we're going to do with college admissions, given that you can do all of this stuff. OK, so that was one of the things. Then another thing that happened that caused me to start paying a little bit of attention, because by the way, I didn't know it could actually do this. Not bad. And then, I, then the next thing that hit me was that I was talking to somebody who worked in private equity. Private equity is, uh, what do you do in private equity? You buy companies, and then you sell companies. Yes? And you buy high, sell low. No, the opposite. You, 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 buy, you buy low, sell high, right? And why is it low? Oh, buy high, sell higher. That's, as long as the sell is higher than the buy, that's fine. But the main question is like, you know, why, why is it low in the first place? Usually in private equity, you buy the, it could be startups, it could also be distressed companies, generally companies that are about to go bankrupt. So I was talking to this, this guy who now runs 
the company that his PE private equity firm bought. And so uh, he's supposed to do something to fix the company. What do you think you're supposed to do to fix a company if you bought one that is uh, losing money? Lay off people. Ah, you, you cut right to the chase, lay off people. <laughs> okay, so he was, we were just chatting and he was talking about how he had, he had just asked his, uh, his marketing team to find a more efficient way to write the blog posts for search engine optimization because he had just heard about this chat GPT. So he had asked the marketing team, why don't you just use chat GPT to write the blog posts? And it was so much faster. And then the marketing team started to wonder about their jobs. <laughs> because if the guy who was brought in with one goal, what's his goal? Yeah. To lay off people is running around telling various people and various departments, try using chat GPT to do your job. <laughs> That's scary, right? So, okay, so that was the next thing that hit, but I was thinking that won't touch my life. Okay, I, I don't write blog posts. I also don't have to apply to college anymore and I don't have to read the college essays. So this is all other people's problems. And then the time that it hit me was when I came back from winter break, that was January. And there was a Carnegie Mellon first year student who came to chat with me about what he had done during winter break. And he told me he spent his winter break writing a program and the program well, he first made an account on tutor.com. You can probably see where this is going. So he made an account on tutor.com. Then he wrote a program. Tutor.com, by the way, is a website that you can use to get questions answered. Uh, you pay to get your question answered. And if you answer the question, you get paid. Very simple concept. The questions and all the discussion are through chat only, hint, hint. So then guess what he did? So his program was connected in. And so when the question came in from tutor.com, he sent it to chat GPT. Now this is a, this is a smart guy, okay? He's, a, he's one of our undergrads. Uh, we have some alums of our uh, wonderful undergrad institution sitting around here. And so he was, he was one, of our, uh, one of our undergrads. So he knew, don't just ask chat GPT to answer the question. He said, answer it as if you're a tutor. You know, by the way, this is not that hard. It's basically like you, you, you feed it in with a function. He applied a very simple function to the input and he passed the function in and the thing comes back. And then he was also quite clever. He took the response and he passed it back into chat GPT saying, please double check. That's a good move, by the way, because if you have played the GPT for a while, sometimes the first thing it gives is wrong. Now, if it failed the double check, it texted him. So then he uh, manually answered the question. If it passed, then we went straight to the the person. And he told me he made $600 before he got shut down for violating terms of service. <laughs> now, when I heard that, I thought $600 is a lot of money. That means that he fooled $600 worth of people. By the way, you don't earn $600 in 10 minutes on tutor.com. Do you know what I mean? Like his thing must be fairly legit. How in the world did his thing survive and earn $600? Because my impression was ChatGPT can't do math because all of our math people were just making fun of it, right? And if he can survive long enough to make 600 bucks without saying some nonsense, then it must be pretty good. So that's when I started looking at ChatGPT and asking it math questions. And I found out it's not bad. Okay, here's a typical question you might ask. Tutor.com. Solve x plus two equals seven. To solve the equation x plus two equals seven, you need to isolate the variable x. Wow, it shows all your work. This is pretty good. I actually just gave a talk at a middle school and I explained this thing shows your work. The teachers were actually very enthusiastic because they're always telling the students, you should show your work. This thing shows your work. Okay, by the way, this thing I didn't get so excited. So, so I mean, this thing I said, okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I could imagine that maybe, maybe something like this is believable. Now I'm just gonna, I'll fool it, right? Okay, all right. Now, what if you accidentally added two to both sides of the equation instead? I was like, this no way you can answer this. Oh, actually, it answers like how I would talk. Wait a second. What about my job? I don't know if you can see the, the words coming across. It's like, it's fairly legit. Okay, I disagree with this part. I disagree with this part, right? The, the problem is that sometimes what it says is not entirely correct. The danger is that it's hard to tell. Okay, that's actually, what we're gonna get towards that because I'm soon gonna be talking about what we need to do next. However, what I wanna say is that I've also noticed depending on what, what time of day you ask, there's always some randomness. Quite often it's actually okay. And usually what I see is that the error rate, there is an error rate, but the error rate is not, not extraordinary high that we, I mean, it's, it's low enough that I'm scared of it. 
in the sense that this thing is able to actually do some kinds of teaching. Okay, so then I, I started looking at this and saying, well, now it even hit, hit my industry. My industry is, is education. I, I teach people things. So if you made $600 from someone in my industry, I should probably care. Because it's the year 2023, I hope to be still in this industry for the next 20 years. And how good is this thing gonna get, right? And then on March 14th, there was GPT-4. So then I got a little bit more curious because when that came out, people said it was good. Actually, the thing that made me realize that I should probably pay more attention is because when the, uh, when the research result came out, well, when, the, when, their, when their advertisement came out, um, they showed how it did on various exams. So this is, this is the, the actual visual from uh, the GPT-4 guys. And what this visual says is the height of the bar is how high of a percentile the, the GPT scores or ranks on a lot of standard exams. Higher is better, of course. 100 is the maximum. Percentile means compared to all of the people in the world, what percent of those people are you better than? The scary thing is it's pretty high on a lot. And the blue is the old GPT 3.5. The green is GPT 4. And GPT 4, of course, is, is more sophisticated. It was able to take people from, or take this thing on uh, the, the tool when it tried to do the AP chemistry exam, went from like about 20th percentile to about 70th percentile of humans. The part that I found interesting was not any of these APs. When I'm recording, I'd be more careful exactly what I say about my feelings about various uh, assessments. So I'll say no further things about those, but there's a, there's a, there are some other exams at the far end, which are very, very low scores. Those at the far end are AMC 10 and AMC 12 and Code Forces rating. Uh, let me quickly tell you what those are because those happen to be quite interesting. So the AMC are the American math competitions. That's how you eventually select for people to go on to the United States International Math Olympiad team. The common theme of those questions is they're supposed to be different from the textbooks. At least that's what we try to do when we make the questions. So there are committees which make these questions, which are specifically trying to make non-textbook problems. When you go and make an AP exam, usually it's supposed to be a textbook problem. I mean, usually it's supposed to be something you've learned how to do. SAT also supposed to be something, something you learn how to do. AMC, it's supposed to be something you haven't seen before. And so you should not be surprised that they used to be at the very, very bottom. There was this strange anomaly, anomaly that on the AMC 12, it got to nearly 50th percentile. At this point, I am actually not 100% sure I believe that it was able to do this and the data is clean. I'm not sure I believe that. But um, I will say it got me curious enough to start asking ChatGPT my own questions about math, which are harder. So now let's start playing with harder questions because solving the equation x plus two equals seven, that's not that big of a deal. Ah, let's do something harder. What is the sum? Oh, it knows it's an arithmetic series. That's nice. Here's the formula. This is, by the way, not super sophisticated yet. This is something that you would learn if you went to high school algebra, right? And it's actually just working out the whole thing, showing every step. By the way, I'm also showing this whole thing out because this should call into question, what are we teaching our kids nowadays anyway? We are actually teaching our kids how to do this thing, and this thing is outperforming them. A lot of kids, when they think about math class, they think about learning how to do a type of problem, practicing a certain way of doing it, and then putting it up. Okay, so this is already able to mechanically go through a lot of the techniques. Actually, a lot of times when people think about education, they think about teaching you a method, and then you practice the method, and then they teach you another method, you practice the other method, and so on. The reason ChatGPT can do this is because it has ingested teacher's manuals. Right? The way that you train these large language models is by feeding it language. And guess what? All of these standard arithmetic series problems, there are teacher's manuals explaining how to do that. So in theory, it should be able to do that. Another way to do this using one plus two plus 50. Oh my, there is. Ah, you can use the sum of the series one, two, 50. Notice the series two, four, and so on up to 100 is formed by multiplying each term in one to 50 by two. Wait a second, <laughs> what's going on here? Okay, this thing is pretty good. That was a little bit surprising for me. That, that, it can, that it can notice this, but maybe, maybe, maybe there are some books out there which also happen to have, uh, you know, happen to have this trick. And actually, after I saw these kinds of things where the tricks can be done in this way, it made me also realize, we used to say that somebody is good at math if they somehow know a lot of tricks. Well, of course, that's not what we really say, but, but, but people, you, a lot of people think someone's good at math if they somehow seem to know all the tricks. That's sort of like saying someone is smart if they know all of Wikipedia. Does that mean Wikipedia is smart? 
Well, no, Wikipedia has larger storage capacity than the average person. And so what's going on here is this has large pattern recognizing capacity. And I guess that's a pattern. But just going on on how powerful this thing is, let's just keep going. This is the one that I threw this on social media because this one blew my mind. Factorize 899. This is a math contest problem. So there is a trick. Anyone know how to do this? This is, this is a really good question. Of course, you know, because some of you here are not the general public. Uh, and so, so the, the thing about this audience is, seems like it's people not the general public, but uh, usually when you factorize a number, you try dividing it by lots of things. And this is a difficult question to do because if you divide it by lots of things, it takes forever. 899, uh oh, no, 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 no. Well, that's interesting, that's interesting. So that's wrong, that's right. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say is that part is here. That part is the part that surprised me. Okay. So is it a prime number? Ah, ah it's not a prime number. By the way, normal people also make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, 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 very good. Is that your final answer? Ah, okay. See, I was trying to gaslight it into maybe saying no, but yeah, yeah. Okay, it's good. This thing's pretty good. But actually, by the way, there are probably enough teachers' manuals with this. But I guess one other thing that made me a bit surprised, something I saw, I saw this uh, on Sunday. I was at a math contest in New Jersey on Sunday. So I'm just going to throw this here because I thought this was hilarious that so I actually could do this too. Uh, th there was a math contest I was at, and here's a question on the math contest. It was um, find whole numbers, A, uh, let's call them x and y, so that 30x plus 31y plus 21 times, no, no, 28 times 1 equals 365. Find whole numbers x and y, so that 30x plus 31y plus 28 times 1 is 365. This is a math contest problem. I won't tell you that yet. Okay. It's a good problem. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really good price. So, so there are ways to do this. You can use modular arithmetic or whatever. Yeah, you know, let's go play with this thing. And it'll do it the uh, brute force way. Okay, brute force. This is, by the way, how I tried to solve it. When I saw this question at that math contest, I was, I was on the screen. I did this, right? You know, you do this thing. And okay, now, now you go like to some, uh, some, some uh, you could do brute force. That's what it's doing there. Some people did modular arithmetic, okay? Now it's going gonna, it's gonna to crank this out. While it cranks this out, I'll give you a hint. This math contest was called the Monmouth Exploratory Math Expo. So their acronym for Monmouth Exploratory Math Expo was meme, M-E-M-E. -M -E. So this question is actually a bit of a joke. Oh, okay, it got it, it got it, it got it. So it solved this problem. And by the way, so far, actually, this thing is reacting pretty smart. Oh, smart, I don't want to use that word. I don't want to anthropomorphize, but it can do a lot of things. And that's why we need to think about being careful. Oh, let's, let's have it do something else. This is a math contest problem. So the numbers are special. Is there a clever way? And I thought on Sunday, this would break it. And I was wrong. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> So by the way, on Sunday, I, I do a lot of things live, if you can tell, I just do it live. Because whenever I do it live, I just use whatever new input came in. On Sunday, I was going to use this as my example of the problem that is in no textbook whatsoever, because it was made up by some random high school students on a math contest called Meme. Who else would come up with a question like this? Okay. This is the, this is the best solution. This is actually how you're supposed to do the problem. That's why it was 28 times one. Okay. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it works. It works. I, I know that 365 days in a year, so this thing has to work. Ah, it works. Okay. Uh, after I, I was giving this talk on Sunday, and by the end of this part, actually, a parent raised her hand and said, I used to not be scared of ChatGPT. Now I am. <laughs> because actually, there are a lot of people who haven't gone in to dive into this. The reason why I am one of their paid subscribers is not because I use this to solve my work, but because I'm every few days poking things at it to go and see what can it do. And I have become increasingly worried about the future of our next generation. Because we're all laughing at this thing, saying, hey, you know, it's pretty good. Oh, it made a mistake. If you go to really an average 
middle or high school student, you have trouble performing at this level. Okay. And then I had, I've, I've talked to people and they said, oh, but come on, chat GPT won't be able to solve international math Olympiad problems. And I explained how many people need to solve international math Olympiad problems. <laughs> the moment when the AI can do everything except international math Olympiad problems, what about jobs? So by the way, I also work with people from all over the world. So in the work that I do, I'll soon move into talking about what we're doing about all of this. But um, in the work I do, we work with people from all over the world. And we have a lot of people from the Philippines that we work with. I happened to be on a phone call last week with our, our, our collaborators in the Philippines. And they told us the sad news that very recently, some of the large outsourcing companies were laying off 10,000 people. You know, we always talk in the United States of, well, you know, it's gonna take away jobs. It's kind of abstract to us that it takes away jobs. There are populations in the world where vast numbers of people do text-based communications, actually even based on written chat. And if the company has the entire record of all written chats in the last two years in customer service, you could train a large language model on that entire body. We're having, okay, I'm sorry. I thought I was giving a, I have to be careful of giving a general public talk or looking at various people in the audience. But when you go and build this technology, which can go and pull in and learn from the patterns in a big body of customer service work, you could actually replace the people. And that's actually what's happening now in entire sections of the world. So this is, this is real, right? The, the, the fact that we are losing jobs, we're, we're also running into danger of what about, what about things over here? So now I've, I've started thinking about what do we do with the next generation? And if you go and think, what do these models do, right? The, the, the things that they are actually trained to do is to find patterns and to be able to follow patterns and maybe generalize patterns, but follow from things that have been done before and then do them again, possibly a little bit more general. That's, that's the general way that these proceed. And when you think about how many of, many of our population engage with education, a lot of times they're being taught to learn a method and follow the method. And we might want to rethink on whether it's worth it to have people do this over and over and over again, instead of trying to figure out one of the things that this should not be able to do as well, which is to come up with new ways to do questions. The sad thing is while we're doing this to teach our next population, we also have lots of researchers who are also, no, it's all right, you can be researchers on it. That's not a sad thing, but I mean, this is a thing that's happening. It's gonna happen no matter what, but there are people who are trying to integrate the, 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 the language models with logic models to make it so they can even come up with new ideas. So what I'm trying to say is it, it is increasingly urgent that we do something to help the next generation to be able to come up with new ideas. That is, I think, one of the pieces that is going to be harder for, for these AIs to reach. So now how do you do that? How do you teach that? Well, we shouldn't do that just by having people practice a lot of things. If you, if you, if you just practice a lot of things, you won't actually be able to learn how to come up with new things as well. Uh, I, I come at this as a practitioner. So I actually go and teach and I teach all different groups. I don't only teach elite students, I will say soon towards the end. I also work with students who are underprivileged, who happen to have gaps in their knowledge base. Because if you want to help people, you need to worry about, worry about everybody. So when, when, when I approach all of this, I see actually that there are many kids who are not used to coming up with their new idea, and in fact have gotten to the point where they think that mathematics is all about having someone already tell them how to do it, and then they follow. So, okay, if you want to teach this, the way that many of us faculty probably teach, and definitely how I teach, is that we often will, will not tell you how to do the problem. I mean, I actually, I still teach at Carnegie Mellon University. I taught a class on Monday, I'll teach another class on Wednesday. That's why this talk is on Tuesday. <laughs> and it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not Pittsburgh Bay Point. Uh, so, so, so anyway, I, I, I can teach these classes. And whenever I teach the class, I'm an old school guy. That's why you might have seen I don't have slides. I don't know how slides work. I don't like slides. I use chalk, Hagoromo to be specific. But anyway, so I, I use chalk. And when I, when I walk into a classroom, I just go in with a piece of chalk and I say, we got, we got this question or this theorem. I, I teach a theoretical class this semester. Here's a theorem. We'd like to prove this theorem. Does anyone have ideas? And then we brainstorm. Some of you have been in my class before. So then we have the students just brainstorm. How do you solve this question? And my job as the instructor is to use your ideas to solve the problem. This makes it more entertaining for me. <laughs> I think it makes a better learning experience for the students too, that's the hope, right? But it makes it so that the students find out that they are capable of solving any question, even if they've never seen it before, because that's every single day's experience. Uh, uh, by the way, the proof they come up with is some wacky thing that I didn't expect would work, but it works. 
okay. And then I show, okay, now another proof. And the student says, oh, I have this other idea. Well, now we got another proof. Also not what I wanted to show you, but it also works. Finally, we show you my proof. But my point is what we always do when we teach, when, when I teach my class, is that uh, I want students to find out that they are capable of coming up with their own way of solving a problem. And this is not only in college. I do the same thing with middle school students. You can do this with all kinds of students. The sad thing is that if you're talking to students who aren't used to this, sometimes the students say, you're not doing your job. You're supposed to tell me how to do it. You're not teaching us anything. Well, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, that's not true. It's much harder to do what I just said because I have to actually be awake. <laughs> and the ideas that I don't think will work usually do work. This is the funny thing that I've learned. And that's why I write out all the students' ideas and somehow, somehow it works. Okay, so this is, actually, uh, this is actually how a lot of us who do coaching. If you ever do after school math coaching, you will find that this is the way that you teach students. At this moment, I also wanna say, I wanna be careful. I'm not trying to criticize mainline educators because we need as many of them as we can have and they do a very difficult job. And by the way, this teaching style that I just described does not work in a general classroom. I know because I go to general classrooms. It works at Carnegie Mellon University. It works in any gifted student, gifted is a bad word, don't like that word. It works in any math club where people have all agreed they wanna think. And when you go into an average classroom and you say, hey everyone, let's brainstorm. 20% of the people brainstorm. 80% of the people watch the other people brainstorm. <laughs> this, I, I'm just explaining to you, this is what happens. The, 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 this is the reality, okay? And so, by the way, that's why when you teach in a regular classroom, you do need to go and find a way to have people do things. I, I actually don't see an easy way to change that piece. However, if you want to teach people how to think of a new idea, you could pull out people who actually are interested in trying to brainstorm and give them a chance to brainstorm together, facilitated by someone who will show how their ideas will work. This is called math team. And in fact, I was fortunate. I went to a public school in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, my parents moved away from Berkeley when I was like three months old or something. So I, I wasn't really here, but I was in Madison, Wisconsin, public school. And it was the math team that saved me and discovered, let me discover that I could actually solve new questions because there were these people who wanted to try harder uh, and we weren't smart. We were just the ones who wanted to try harder and someone came along and facilitated all of this. And that was amazing. Unfortunately, not every school in the United States has this. We'll get towards that by the end of this talk too, because I'm, I'm going to be talking about a scalable solution soon. Okay. So, however, I'm, oh, yes. Sorry. Can you, yes. Can you like a moment? Yes. That, um, you know, in addition to being able to write all the test essays, Chat GPT was also able to take in proof ideas and convert them into proofs. So what you're saying is maybe you could try to automate this exact thing by having ChatGPT also get in proof ideas, right? So you, you basically want a translation layer that takes the ideas that students are saying, turn them into the logical pieces, and then have the thing put together in logical pieces and feed it back at the students. It, it's, it deals with the problem of the teacher having to be awake. Yes. So, so, so what he says is it deals with the problem of the teacher being awake. So there, by the way, there are two ways to attempt to solve this problem, right? So we're, we're both, now we're both thinking, how do we solve this problem? Because it would be optimal to give the students this kind of a dynamic experience. One way to solve the problem is to attempt to do it while also putting all the teachers out of work. <laughs> There's another way to do it, which involves having people do it. So, um, I happen to be on the employing people side. So, so I, I, I agree with you that in theory, it could be very possible for a Silicon Valley company to come up with a way to attempt to do this whole thing uh, and then not have to have people involved. I'm personally not interested in doing that. So I will let someone else do that and eventually make us obsolete. That's fine with me. But in the meantime, what we will do is we will try to have as many people involved as possible. And also, as I explain this approach, you will see there will be a point in this where it's actually quite hard to have the computer do an important piece, which is helping a student feel loved and feel like they have a future. That, that part we'll get into this soon too, because there's actually a lot of psychological aspect to this too. Uh, and you know, we, we have another 25 minutes. And so as, as I keep going, I will agree that from the 
pure like delivery of the of the logic that is there. But maybe to do a fast forward, one of the things that I've seen, especially since my work these days also involves working with underserved students, there's actually a, an entire gap that needs to be jumped when it comes to reaching people who don't have parents who have been telling them since they were one day old that they need to be really good at mathematics. There are parents in the world to tell their kids since they're like one year old that they have to be good at mathematics. Uh, and there are also other parents who don't. But at the same time, sometimes those students, not just sometimes, those, uh, those other students have potential too. And so then there's a deep question of where do you add this interpersonal piece? We'll get to that, okay? But what you're saying actually in theory would work. I actually do believe there are people at my university who are trying to latch together these, we have, we have people doing, what is it? There's this, there's this, there's this automated theory improving work at Carnegie Mellon University. There's this language, what was that? Right. I, I, I should know this, but anyway. They're, they're, maybe, maybe. So, so there, are, there are people who are specifically working on these languages so that you can go and do automatic theory improving. So in theory, yes, you should be able to marry these two. I guess I, I, I guess I should also say to me, maybe I, I'm fast forwarding again to something else, but when I see what do we need our next generation to do, I sort of have come to the, I've come to the point where they have to come up with new ideas and they also have to learn how to be as human as possible. We will get to that point soon too. It's like, what, what, what does human mean? Because in some sense, okay, maybe I'll say it now. Because in some sense, uh, one of the things that I liked doing when I was doing that was the fact that the question is clearly specified and then the answer is a clear function from the input to the output. And those made me the most comfortable when there was a clearly specified problem. Those are also the easiest to automate. But the, interesting, the most interesting and hard problems in this physical real world are the ones which are really fuzzy on the, what are the parameters you're trying to optimize anyway? And how do you balance this ethical thing versus that ethical thing? And did you realize that it might have this other impact? Those are very fuzzy. And so in some sense, if you can learn to love and do well in the fuzzy problems, well, then that's going to be something that will still be harder to automate. So again, we're getting to this human piece. And you'll see soon as I talk about the solution, there's a lot of human piece inside it because that's what we're trying to build up. Okay, but so back to this idea. So we're trying to figure out a way to teach people how to come up with their own ideas. And I'm trying to do this in a way which can be done today. And also, yeah, which can be done today. That's the important piece. And the difficulty, of course, as I've just said, if you want to add more classes, this is not replacing school. Because as I've said earlier, in a normal school, you cannot just do this as a replacement for math class because you might have 80% of kids doing nothing. So, okay, need to add more. You know, we already have a teacher shortage. So if we already have a teacher shortage, this doesn't work. We have to scale this. And in fact, in the past, most people in this space were always trying to scale this with automation, like coming up with algorithms. By the way, Khan Academy recently announced that they are working with uh, OpenAI to attempt to make a totally automated tutor for teaching you the routine stuff. So this is what people are doing anyway in Silicon Valley. But I actually came up with another way. It's actually very different. And the way that I approach the world is I think about the world through the lens of game theory. So I like to come up with ways to solve problems where you think about incentives of lots of people and somehow align all the incentives so that everyone does the right thing. This is actually analogous to a mathematical proof, except that you're not writing logical statements. You're thinking about how people interact. So I need to solve this problem. And I, I also realized as I was going to actual schools that the age you really want to hit this on is younger if possible preferably sixth grade or younger. Younger is hard though, because they might not sit still. So sixth grade is sort of where we realized you need to go. Okay, so we wanna teach those. And the way I came up with that came from solving another problem at the exact same time. So there was another problem I was thinking about. You see, I work with the country's top high school math students. And it turns out that they have a problem too. They're trying to get into college. And it turns out that if you're very good at math, one of the biggest challenges to getting into a top university is not your math skills, nor is it how many AP exams you have, nor is it whether you got also a perfect score on the computer programming Olympiad, nor is it whether you got a linguistics Olympiad perfect score or a chemistry, whatever. It's actually usually around personality, communication skills to be, spe to be specific. So actually there's a lot of people in the country for which their math is amazingly good, amazingly good. And if they could, lift their communication skills and interpersonal skills to the next level, they would be even more successful, not just in college, but in everything. So I started a program for high school students. What we do is we bring in people who are really good at math. They, they can do any middle school math contest problem like No Tomorrow. There's a lot of these people, by the way, 
a lot of these people, maybe many of the people who work here were, were like that when they were in high school as juniors, 11th grade. And then what we do is after we have these people, I hire professional comedians and actors and actresses to teach them how to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> because I did this too. So about five years ago, I was trying to get more people interested in math around the country. I was supported by the Overdeck Family Foundation. It's a philanthropic foundation. And they, they got me a PR agency to work on communicating math out to the US public. And the first thing the PR agency told me is that you have a big problem. You don't know how to talk to normal people. All you know how to talk to are math nerds. <laughs> they actually told me that. So they said, you need to take performing arts classes. And so I did. It was one of the best investments of my life. They only cost about $15 an hour. I'm strongly recommending these, by the way. Improvisational comedy classes. Improvisational comedy classes, 15 bucks an hour, maybe because of inflation, 20 bucks now. But um, after doing this, I spent for an entire year, I was doing these classes for about three hours a week. And by the time I was done, I never had to prepare for a single lecture again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it saves more time than you spend. It's actually true. This is, this is what I discovered, because it, it would give you the ability to use your domain knowledge to then dynamically run every single class, every single experience to match whatever the audience has. That's actually what you learn in this. By the way, I'm strongly recommending this for anybody in academia. It's actually, is, it's a time saver. It's a time saver. I guess you other things too. Okay, and now we teach all of our high school students this. This, by the way, is very helpful to them. We can already see because the Ivy League admission decisions came out last week, Thursday. And we can see a correlation based on the small data that we have so far that people who actually have both the math ability and some really strong performing arts training, somehow they're really good at interviews. Actually, they're not only good at interviews. I have high confidence that they will be extremely successful in the world, extremely. Because these are people who have both the, the intellectual power and they have learned how to listen to people and read people and make people laugh at the right times and get their idea across. Actually, when I was talking about this at an event that had the mayor of Pittsburgh in it, um, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you are creating a generation of extremely dangerous people <laughs> because they both can think super fast and they could pitch any venture capitalist, build any team, get any philanthropy they want and go. I said, yeah, that's true. That's why our first admissions point for this high school program is you have to be a nice person. Actually, we do this. We, we have several criteria. In order to get into our high school program, you have to get in. You can't just pay us. It doesn't work. Actually, if you get in, we pay you. I'll get to that soon. But so, so the point is for this high school program, we have a very stringent admissions process. And it's not that you have to be an amazing comedian, but you do have to be nice. And that's because of, you know, we, we are thinking ahead of this. And also because when I see people who do the latest and greatest in develop, developing technology, I see so many students at my university who are going to be at the forefront of developing technology. I do think it's very important that everyone who gets powerful skills also has this strong sense of what will you do with those skills? I think this is actually a very important point. Anyway, whatever. So we got this thing. So we have this high school program. And by the way, this works because it turns out that now everyone wins in this circle in the sense that the drama people, we give them jobs. It's great because it turns out that there are a lot of people in the performing arts industry who are trying to audition for Hollywood roles and Broadway roles. And while you're auditioning, you need to do something to pay your bills. As I said, I like to talk to people to learn what your life is and what you do. And I found out that there were people who have great drama skills and they're driving Uber Eats because you need to do something, right? While you're auditioning. I asked, how much do you make from Uber Eats? Okay, we beat that. We beat that, that's, that's easy. Okay, so, so what I'm trying to say is that we, we now have this, this ecosystem running on this side. Now, how do the two connect? This is the point where finally everything goes through because so far I don't have a connection. I don't have a, I don't have a self-sustaining machine until you connect them across. Suppose you actually want to learn how to communicate and to be able to talk and to make people, to, if you want feedback on your expressions, you need to talk. You can't just watch an expert. What do you think people who are really, really good at math are happy to talk about? Math, <laughs> bam. This now runs 
live video math classes like what the world has never seen before. Let me show you what these look like. Okay, so I'm going to now I'm going to show you what we have actually turned this whole thing into because I'm actually talking at a theory seminar here, but I'm actually a practical guy. I make things, so I'm now going all the way to the. It's not just an idea; it exists, and I'm going to show you a one-minute video clip snipped just randomly in the middle of one of our Zoom classes. Zoom classes, because the only way to be able to do something like this at large scale across the world is to use the internet. Wait, Zoom class. Did you guys like Zoom class? That was a two thumbs down for lots and lots of people. Zoom class, I didn't even know if anyone was paying any attention. Okay? And furthermore, it was hard to feel like you were there. Well, let me show you what this Zoom class looks like. And you'll see two people teaching the Zoom class. The two people are high school students. I'm going to geek out soon over the, the incentive alignment of how all that was built. But there are two high school students teaching this class. You'll see them on screen, a boy and a girl. They are, by the way, both insanely good at math. Like their, their math achievements are at, like, very good in their state. Uh, and you'll see how they talk and so on. You won't see any middle school students in this video, the, the, who they were teaching, for privacy reasons. It's because we don't want to show images of the people we're teaching to the general public. However, in every class, those people are also popping up on the screen. So you'll see the interplay between two of the high school instructors. And this is just a random clip in the middle of a class for one minute. And this is what we've turned Zoom class into. Minutes later. So as we were saying, they still meet at the midpoint. That's a great point made by Ayush. And then now seeing this, since they go at the same speed, this the green one goes here at the same time the red one goes there. And then 20 times two gives you 40. Because if it takes 20 minutes for green to go here from the first one to the right one, at 60 miles per hour, 20 minutes is 20 miles. And then this is also 20 miles, so we get 40. Awesome. So, oh, I mean, Audrey, do you have anything else to add? I think that's a really good solution by Ayush. By yeah, it's really good. And one of the better things about that solution is that you actually don't really need to know how fast the trains are traveling. You can just use the symmetry to sort of. Yeah. Solve. So, yeah. I actually like that you point out symmetry because symmetry is always cool to see. And I think being able to see it in problems like this makes it more fun and also like makes it more elegant, I guess. But without further ado, Professor Lowe, is there another way to do this problem? But I promised you that there would be another way to do this question as well. That's what we've done to Zoom class. We are able to produce Zoom classes live at enormous scale across the entire world, which all look and run like that, taught by people who know the math like the back of their hand. Because any of you who have ever done math competitions know that you're used to looking at math competition questions with the first glance and having to think right away. And so what we did is we brought in people who are high schoolers who already have that skill. So the domain knowledge is there. And then the performing arts aspect, well, there's one piece in this whole ecosystem that is the one that put the final incentive alignment inside. We are the only people in the world who realized you can run Zoom classes. Oh, we don't need to turn the lights down. I, I, that's, it, it's okay. Oh, that was accident, doesn't matter. So, um, we, so maybe if you can unlean on that. That would be great. Oh, okay, it's a bit fine. We'll, we'll fix it another way. But in any case, we'll pretend that was on purpose. But in any case, uh, what we have is inside every single one of these one of these classes, we have the basic unit, which is two high school students teaching, and we have a drama coach in every single Zoom class because there are enough performing arts people out there. In every single Zoom class that we run, there are two high school students and a performing arts person. You know what that does? And that, by the way, that is the piece that then in the math proof connects everything together. Because now here's why everyone wins. Middle school students, they got this now. The, the performing arts person also makes sure it's entertaining. Performing arts person is not a math expert at all. They are an emotional expert. They see the faces of the students learning, they see the faces of the people teaching, and they figure out how to match input and output <laughs> to, to make everyone have a good time. Does that make sense? It's entirely possible. And those people, by the way, are experts at emotion. What I've learned by working with people in the performing arts world is that I may know things about the logical side, but there are people who spend as much time thinking about emotions as I do about logic. We have a lot to learn from them. So we hire them. And then they come in and they teach. And so now, by the way, the, I'll get to you in a moment. And then the other piece of incentive alignment is for the high school student. You know what you get? 
by teaching one hour of this class, it's not for community service. You could, if you want to be a nice person, maybe you could think that way. But we've actually given you the world's most efficient way to get one hour of coaching on your smile and your delivery and your posture and your ability to magnetize. You put in one hour, you get one hour back. Does this make sense? Like that, that's, this is a thing which if you're a high school student and you would like to figure out how to improve your ability to communicate, well, you should hire somebody. Where, how are you gonna find them? We've just managed to make the whole thing available at scale. There was a question over there. So just in this example, can you give us a sense of how the performing arts person would intervene? Okay, in this example, here's what the performing arts person does. First of all, as you can see, we do a bunch of technology stuff. So there's the lights, there's the drawing on the screen, whatever. Every high school student has actually a two screen setup. We, we send them their equipment. Equipment can be amortized. The cost can be amortized because we ship equipment kits all around the country as high school students switch up whether they're in or not. So we have an entire inventory that's running across the country, okay? But basically the high school students have two screens. One screen, they're able to see the image that they're sending through just like the weather person on TV. The weather person on TV stands in front of a green background and points at things. Do you know what I mean? Like that's how the weather forecast works. And then they look and see what they're sending to the other the outside world. So these high school students, they can see the big merged image that they have to do that because when they're writing in the air, they're not writing in the air, they're, they're compositing an image and they're sending that out. By the way, letting high school students see what they look like as they talk to other people is actually pretty useful if you're, if you're watching that thing. Okay, that's one side. The other screen, there is a feed directly from the actress or actor because the actor and actress actor or actress is inside the zoom room with the camera off and microphone off so the middle school students don't even know that she's there this is an important detail we're using everything about the internet to put in things that couldn't be done before if you put the drama queen in a normal classroom no one's going to watch the teacher okay you're going to watch the drama queen. But so what we have here is the drama person is hidden, except that there's a parallel video call going on on the other screen where the drama person, their, their face, their smile, their gestures are visible, as well as their text written chats. These days, high school students are used to processing enormous amounts of streams of text coming at them. It's true. And, and they are. They are. They're, they're very good at looking at videos, changing uh, faces here. It's true. And then like all this text coming in. So while they're talking, there's text comments coming in from the, from the drama expert. And then if you noticed, there was a time when I showed up. I'm not live. You can't scale me to be in every single class that we're running. But the way they put me in is the same way that live television news works. If you watch CNN, when they say, hey, now, now let's go to John, our correspondent in New York City. That was taped. That was taped. Do you know what I mean? Like, John is not recording this right now, broadcasting from New York City. He taped it an hour ago. An hour ago. So actually, our high school students, they all have the library of videos that they will put on of me, and they know the first sentence of every video. So that's why he said, Professor Lowe, can you show us another approach to this question? And I say, oh, yeah, let me show you another approach to this question. <laughs> we're, using the, we're basically using the entertainment industry's tricks to do mathematics education, if you know what I mean. Like, basically, by the way, the reason I thought of all these things is because my university, CMU, we are very good at technology, but we also have one of the top drama schools in the country. If you didn't know before, just remember that Carnegie also made Carnegie Hall in New York City. So if you ever come to Carnegie Mellon University, you have this weird experience where there are incredibly good tech people and incredibly good performing arts people because we have both sides. So I just thought, okay, let's bring all that in. So now suddenly all this is coming across and while I'm on screen, then she, the performing arts expert, unmutes entirely and talks in the audio channel, giving all kinds of feedback on the last thing that just happened. My video, by the way, shows up every approximately four minutes playing for two minutes. By the way, the high schoolers, they have a track. The high schoolers, they don't have to prepare for the class at all. This is a very important detail. When you, when you align incentives, these kinds of high school students have no time, no time. So all they do is five minutes before the class, pop on the equipment, make sure everything works. And then when the class starts, they play the first video. Oh, they say first, they tell the class, hey, Professor Lowe, what are we gonna do today? Press play. Oh, that's what we're gonna do today. <laughs> okay, and then, and then their job is that they facilitate the discussion, because remember, the whole point is the middle school students come up with ideas, so they, they make the ideas work. When they're done, they say, Professor Lo, how did you do the problem? Okay, my video shows for three minutes, then it goes ding, and a new question shows on the screen, and they say, hey, here's a new question. Everyone, let's think about this one. 
an hour later, the high school student's job is done. We have made it so that the excess time is approximately 10 minutes. And the one hour dose in the middle is your access to a professional performing artist. You see the incentive alignment? The point is we made it so that you don't have to prepare for class. You don't have to do anything other than, did you want your dose of a professional? Oh, sure, just go and do this. And by the way, we'll pay you too. That's because we have to be legal. In the United States, if somebody does work, you have to pay them. So, okay, we pay them too. The reason the entire thing works, by the way, is because now, now you can see the through way. This is a completely incentive aligned ecosystem. There are actually enough high school students, enough performing arts people. How many high school students are there? Let's start to size this. Let's size this to see how practical this is. Well, let's just first think, how many people every year are trying to get into Harvard, Yale, MIT, Princeton, Caltech, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago, Duke, University of California, Berkeley? Well, there's a lot of people. So there's actually, I estimate approximately 100,000 high school students out there for whom this would be a very good thing for them to do. Maybe this won't help them all get into these dream schools, but it'll give them some, some very valuable skill. And the important thing is they know enough math to teach people. By the way, you also don't need to have tons of people teaching the few really good, really good students. You can actually go and spread this whole thing out. So you might have the top 0.1% of the people teaching the next 1% and so on. And if you strategically lay this out, you could actually do a whole lot of damage Sorry, I mean in a good way, right? You, you, can, you can actually have, you could have 100,000 people contributing to this. That's, that's how, how big of a, of a size I see there is in terms of the high school group. Uh, by the way, that also happens to be on the same order of magnitude as the number of people who participate in math competitions, like Math Counts, AMC. So these numbers are not just like me pulling them out of anywhere. They are actually based on what we see in terms of the numbers of people out there who are at, at this level. Okay, the ratio is 10 to one, by the way. 10 to one in the sense that the, for each high school, we've got 10 middle school. So we could potentially, this thing is something that could potentially scale to million. That's pretty exciting because now we have a sudden, another, another group that we can bring in and the number of performing arts people you need for that is on the order of magnitude of a thousand. Fair enough. So when you, when you look at this, this is just a, a different way to, to, to scale everything so that everyone actually wins. The way that we know this works it's because it actually started blowing up. So I've done a bunch of things in my life and most of them didn't work because uh, that was before I realized you should make things that do what people want. Uh, but this, this concept came to me in, uh, in October of 2021. And, and I've, I've been working in this space, by the way, for about eight years before that on all kinds of things that didn't quite scale in education. And finally, I got this idea. And it's like, when you come up with a math proof, again, because I'm, a, I'm actually a theoretical mathematician, once you come up with a math proof, you know that actually every piece, every implication works, it's airtight. And as soon as I saw this thing was airtight, I said, okay, let's build the technology. So I started building the technology and the thing started scaling. At this point, we have 100 high school students. Um, it's a year later, it's a year in, 100 high school students. We have over a thousand middle school students who have been going through this thing. The thing is continuing to grow at the speed of people finding out about it, because basically where this fits in is that there are actually people, believe it or not, who are parents of middle school students looking for enrichment classes. If you drive down to the south part of the Bay Area, you see these classes everywhere, right? So they're, they're, this is a known market. Basically what I said is there's a known market out there. We threw this into the market. And so actually the reason why we can run everything is because even economically, it makes sense. The known market has a known price for the thing I just showed. And what we did is we undercut the price and we increased the quality. And so at that point, the, everything starts to grow naturally. Now, when we talk about what is this actually adding, I agree that an artificial intelligence could give all of that feedback and so on. But if you notice what else we have told our high school students to do is to show love, to show care, to encourage, to make people really feel like being there. Actually, we always tell them, you're a game show host. This is also good for the high school student. The amount of confidence it builds in somebody who might not have been the super cool person at school. I wasn't, okay? If you give them a, a chance for an hour or two a week to be the star, then they get used to actually feeling confident. So, so this is actually adding the value there. There's other stuff that this is doing. There's more incentive alignment stuff to geek out on. Why did I put two people there? I put two people teaching every class because I am a graph theorist. And the definition of a graph is that you have a bunch of vertices, which are the nodes, and you have a bunch of edges, which are called pairs of vertices. 
That was me geeking out over mathematics. But basically the concept is if you make the basic unit to always include two high school students, you make friends. This is solving another problem. The other problem is there aren't enough spots in the Ivy League universities for all the students that we're working with. The scale that we're aiming for is such that we cannot promise everyone you'll get to Ivy League. And anyway, why do you have to go to Ivy League? That's just like some ancient thing that there were some, some schools which played football or something like that, right? So what you really want is you want to get into some ecosystem where there are other people who trust you, who know you well enough, who at some point when you want a job will recommend you. So I said, well, you don't need to wait to age 18 to go to some physical building covered with Ivy to build that network. What if you spend a few hours co-teaching with somebody and you build a graph, you build a network where we are intentionally connecting the person in Nevada with the person in Ohio to teach for 20 hours. When you teach for 20 hours with somebody else, you are not competing with them. In the old school math competitions, which I did, you would go and you'd meet someone else from the other state and you each have a buzzer and one of you will die. I mean, one of you will, will, will lose. That's not that. But one of you, one of you, you know what I'm talking about, everyone? You, you eliminate one of them. So you're, so you're nervous, right? So you're nervous. What we did is we worked together. Work together. And if you work together, you build a friend. And you're defending against all these middle school students. So that's what we're doing here. And I'm going to go to Q&A. Before that, I just want to say there's a whole arm of this which is scholarship related too. Like the point is, I just described something which actually can be used for anything. But we have a heart. So we actually also care about the underserved. There's a whole other arm of this where there are students who don't have parents who are enrolling them in this. So we've gone and talked to philanthropists. And so actually there are people who have donated classes. They've basically purchased classes. And what we do is we go out of our way into Title I schools. These are schools with high fractions of free and reduced lunch to specifically recruit classes of high motivation, low access students. Our very first class actually started yesterday, yesterday, yesterday evening. And so if there are people here who work with underserved schools in the Bay Area, if you happen to have connections, I'll be happy to talk to you. It will cost them nothing. And what they will get is they will get the world's, some of the world's highest quality trained in both math and in performing arts coaches to go and help them be as successful as possible. Thank you. I wanted to leave enough time for free ranging Q&A because that's way more fun. So I see lots of questions. Was there one back here? I thought I had seen one back here and we'll go there too. So um, yeah, let's go there. Uh -huh. So um, I have a similar teaching technique. Even though I'm a mathematician, I chose to teach entrepreneurship for engineers because there's a lot more flexibility. And if somebody doesn't get the right answer, you can work with it and, and uh, do it. So I really enjoyed it. The one missing element from your story is stories. I tell all these stories. I grew up in Silicon Valley, so I knew Steve Jobs, and we built an Apple One, and that gets people really intrigued, especially at a young age, and especially when they say, oh, how do you know these, these people are? And then you tell the story. I mean, a lot of the great inventors, but the, there are four things that I look for that I can tell you what the likelihood of success is in the initial class. One of them was if you were a kid, did you try to read the encyclopedia cover to cover? No, this with Elon Musk and all. So there's all these factors that go in. So you want to kind of get them excited, but the story elements are very crucial because they'll remember the story and then they'll remember all the techniques that go with it. Yeah, I think that's great. So what you just said is the storytelling element is a great way to get kids to suddenly latch onto something. By the way, our high school students do use that too. They might not know Steve Jobs. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're teaching, yeah. Yeah, but, but what, what happens, what we do see is maybe the stories will be about some cool math thing or some cool experience they had with math. This is actually why we give them the improvisational comedy training. Improvisational comedy sets you up to randomly tell a story at any given time and then pull back onto track. So actually, the, the flow that the high school students get is they just know that there are these particular videos which will get them back on track. And they have the time points to do that. In between, they can carry between by either using the ideas students have, or if they see the need to do a story thing, they can do that too. So actually, I'll say, basically, you're saying there's a good tactic to use. And what we do is we tell our high school students all of these various tactics that they then use their own brain to decide when to deploy this tactic or when to deploy that one. Yeah, and you yeah. use broad range of elements. Broad range of elements. So for instance, we worked with this fashion designer, Jane Lawrence. And she uses mathematics, she's a lot of practical stuff. 
But then people that want to be fashion designers can also relate to that. Yes. You find a particular thing that they really want to relate yes. to. And I see somebody doing it and they said, I can be like that person. Yes. I mean, that's great. That's great advice. In fact, I will tell our high school students that this weekend. Because the way we work is, I, I mentor all of these people. We have this community. And basically, it's what the high school students in our community, we get office hours with every single week. And whenever we do the office hours, we always go around. And every high school student shares a tip that they were thinking about this week, about communication or performance or teaching. And by the way, that is how we exchange ideas. It's sort of like, you know, teachers, well, actually, professors, we don't do that. But anyway, what, what we actually do in our community is we will intentionally go through and say, here are some tricks that we know. And then that way, each person goes and grabs other people's tricks and so on. So I will share that one at our next meeting. Thank you. So when are you flying back? Yeah. Oh, tonight. But but I was that. So I will actually be back in. Okay, let me. Uh, I'll take another question. So uh, I'll just tell you, I'm a little bit crazy. So you can find me again. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. So I'll be back. I have to teach a class tomorrow, you see. So I gotta go. <laughs> but then I'll be back because there's a math competition at Berkeley. Oh, I'll be in the Berkeley area on the 15th. Um, it gets easier to find me around the country once you get to me because I don't have class anymore. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there was another question around here. Yes. Uh, yeah. So let's go back, back a little bit to your earlier point about using, you know, one of the things you look for is being, being a good person and all that. So a lot of times when new technologies are is invented, you have an idealistic beginning. You have like the promise of, a, of improving the human condition. And then it gets co-opted by various things like the technologies used for mass surveillance and, and whatnot. So you have a, a sort of dystopian element to any new technology that comes up along. I was wondering what your what your thought is about chat GPT in that realm. Oh my gosh. Okay, so <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask me how we are gonna protect against ours being used. Yeah, that that too. <laughs> so I'll answer that one first. Yeah. That's why we don't take any investors. Actually, the thing I'm just, I'm also an entrepreneur. This whole thing, by the way, if you are coming from a business school perspective, I've just showed you a cash flow positive, bootstrappable ecosystem where you get paid before delivery of product. This is called exponential growth. Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing. And so we don't take any investors. I've had investors talk to me, and the answer is no, because I'm crazy. And I don't want somebody who will be on the board of directors saying, I have a way of saving 1% of your cost by doing X. So, so that, that, that's one my answer there. And that's related to my answer on the other question, which is that whenever a piece of technology is made or there's a company, I always am curious, what is the purpose of the company? <coughs> who controls the company? Who's on the board of directors? And what is their objective? That's a question that we'll all have to answer. As we look at the various powerful companies in the world, they are not actually necessarily entirely run by their founders. Governance. These are all, this is actually very practical stuff. There are entities in the world, they are called companies. They have rules. Their rules are to follow their board, their, their charter, or whatever it is. And when you start looking at this, then you see the incentives don't quite align because sometimes there might be an idealistic person who does not control the board of the directors. Uh, that's actually why I went through the effort to build something where I do. And okay, now of course I could be an evil person, so maybe that's bad, but I promise you. Yeah, that's what they all said. Anyway, <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to say is like all these other things. Okay, what do I think about ChatGPT though? I think whether it's being intentionally used for evil things or not, it is practically putting tons of people out of work right now. Right now. And so, well, what are we going to do about that? We got, we got to think. Let's go here. So, what kind of reception did you get from your students for your methods? Oh, for this thing. The receptions I got, so I, I traveled around the whole world. I was in Hong Kong over spring break. I happened to meet some students who were in this class. One of them told me, this is the only class I will wake up at 8 a.m. to do. Think of the time zone difference. They are taking the 8 a.m. class. Of course, because now there are lots of people in China and Hong Kong who want to do this, we have open dedicated times for them. The beauty of this system is we just open time zones and then we say, okay, there will be a 21 hour classes at this time zone, uh, who wants to join? And so now we're just opening for their time zone. But that's the kind of feedback we got. We got other, yeah, is that the kind of question you were asking? What kind of learning outcomes did you get? Learning outcomes. Well, it's only been one year. So all I can see is anecdotally, the students who go through this thing are somehow very able to think about new ideas, which was the goal. We actually are still in the process of getting research on actual outcomes. I'll tell you why we're doing that. We're doing that because of the scholarship angle. So. We, by the way, already, okay, I should put it this way. 
there's already a market for people looking for these kinds of classes. For those people, when they see this, they can already see that there's an improvement, so they can come in. But there's also this entire other world we're going into, which is there are public school districts out there which are spending money to try to help students learn. And there are definitely going to be some outliers in those, in those public school systems. And so as our scholarship side grows, we actually have a third party research agency, which is wanting to join. Join means we will, they, want, they need to get paid, of course, right? So, so as, as we grow big enough, then we will, of course, be able to get them paid, not by us, but by philanthropy, to analyze what we're doing. And then at that point, so the reason we're doing that is because we don't want to run forever on philanthropy. Oh, I just mentioned philanthropy because we've got two arms. We've got one arm, which is just purely growing this thing and helping to have people learn. But I also have actually spent a lot of my time trying to make sure that this new thing doesn't exponentially expand the equity gap. Because I also work in education, right? So to me, it, this is also very dangerous. If I put this thing out here and we just say, hey, let's just go make bank, uh, we could, and then we'd leave behind a huge number of people. So I'm doing what a startup founder should not do. Instead of running and just making the money, I'm spending my time going to low-income schools and understanding how to solve that problem so that we make sure everyone grows together. This is actually because that's, that's why I don't want somebody in charge telling me, stop wasting your time going to those places. That's what they would say. I'll do it anyway, right? But the point is now we're doing that. That one, hopefully, as we get that to grow, we'll get the research. And then the research we actually fully expect. Because you see, here's what I'll say. I'm actually a professional coach. <laughs> I've been doing this stuff for like 20 years. And so if you've been professionally coaching mathematics for 20 years, you sort of know what techniques work. And you know when you, know when you see something. And so what I basically saw here is I saw that these high school students with improvisational comedy training and the support of performing arts experts could approximate my teaching style very quickly. Actually, one of them told me he was at a summer camp and somebody else told him, you sound like Professor Lowe. <laughs> okay, fair. I mean, like, that was fast. What I'm trying to say is like, it's not like I'm the best teacher, but I know that the way I do things is effective. And we're able to very rapidly get people to, to, to pull this up by combining domain expertise and performing arts. That was, I guess, the, the interesting nugget is that the performing arts and the domain expertise rapidly gives you two dimensions that span a large space of, 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 of skills. Okay, I'm gonna always go back and forth, yeah. I have a question about uh, the meaning of doing everything. Because I heard you love to talk about a lot about uh, getting to Ivy League schools, getting to good jobs. But like, I remember you asked the question, like how many people here are trying to get into Ivy League schools and like UC Berkeley schools like that. But I also have a question inside that's asking how many people trying to get into Ivy Leagues know their means for getting into these schools. Because we have to admit that Okay, for those people in our audience, if you, if you know the meaning of getting into these schools, you're great, but we have to admit that a lot of people who are trying to get into these schools simply because they are good schools, they have good ranking, so they can perform well in their resumes, they can, I mean, they can probably be promised a good job, like, especially in Berkeley, how many people trying to get into a CS major are actually interested in CS? Not many, probably 90% 90, 90 of people trying to get a CS major is trying to find a job opportunity out of CS. They're not really interested in CS. How many people trying to get into laws are in, interested in being an entrepreneur? Not many, May, maybe 75% of people are trying to be a consultant and earn some money and call it a day. And I, I was asking, especially in an AI era, like this method, I don't think it really works because these people are trying to learn fundamental stuff and get jobs. And these jobs are those jobs that are really prone to being fired because these people don't have outstanding skills. They learn skills out of pragmatism, not passion. And I was going to ask, like, what's your view? What's your perspective on this? Like how your education methods can actually I let people have passion, not just let people adhere to the like predetermined qualities the society wants us to have, but actually people go outside, go above and beyond the quote unquote standard to ensure we have a better future no matter how AI is developed. This is a very good point. So this is actually what inspires me to do a lot of the things that we're doing. I didn't go to an Ivy League school myself. <laughs> So, I mean, when I say this stuff about Ivy League, this is part of meeting people where they are. Whenever I want to get people to do things, you, you sort of first need to talk to them where they are, and then you can convince them to go somewhere else, okay? So what we are actually doing here is 
we don't think that you have to go to an Ivy League to succeed. The advice I tell all of my students is that the way you succeed is not by getting some famous degree. It's by making sure you have lots of really good friends who are capable and you know can go to powerful whatever, who are two years older than you. Because then you get a job through them. <laughs> okay? Or, or if it's not two years old, then later on they're the same age as you and somebody is doing something and you join their startup and so on. So actually what I tell everyone is the value of the Ivy League University actually a lot of it is in the brand, is in, is in the network. It's that you're in this network, so you're able to get the job and somebody else says, oh, I like the name of that university, uh, I will hire you because of that. But ultimately those are brand and network, right? What I realized is that you don't have to build your network out of small, complete graphs. So what I mean by this is that, it, so this is now showing you how I look at the whole world. I'm actually still a mathematician underneath. When you look at the Ivy League world, and the UC and the Cal world, when I say small complete graphs, it's not really complete, it's small dense graphs. It's that there are these bunch of people and they all have very strong connections to each other. And then these have strong connections to each other. And somehow enough of them end up having enough power to help you get your jobs. What I said is you can also have an N vertex graph where every vertex has degree six. You can find a way to just make it so that all these people from 14 years until 18 years have co-taught and built strong relationships with six to 10 other people. And there's a theorem in pure mathematics that says that if you build a random graph with random, every vertex having a degree D, and the D is bigger than three, it turns out to be bigger equal to three, it turns out to be what's called an expander graph. That's probably not what we expected in a general public talk, but the basic concept is that your, your connectivity, your, your, your distances to all kinds of other vertices become very, very low. And there are many, many redundant paths to them. So what I said is, look, I'm just building a random network where every node has six to 10 connections, which are good with other people who have been selected in, not necessarily because they are like doing all these AP exams, but because they were nice, they were very good at math, and somehow they were pretty committed to thinking that interpersonal skills are important. These are the three criteria to get into our high school program. We, by the way, reject people who have very strong math contest scores that fail the other two. You do not get into our program for free by having a gold medal on the International Math Olympics. You do not. You have to have all three of them. And so what we did is we said, look, let's just build this network. Suddenly, it doesn't have to be limited by Ivy League's walls. Our network is however big it is. And the point is, what really is important is that you have all these other people. By the way, right now, I'm counseling our high school seniors in this program. Counseling because they're making the decisions on colleges and so on, right? But the beautiful thing is, I just explained to them, you're fine because you have this network here, right? So wherever you're gonna go, you're gonna still be plugged into this network. So the fact that you have gone and made trusted relationships with people who are on their way to various positions of power and whatnot, then you'll be okay. And also, by the way, that's also why when we run our weekly meetings, it's all about like these other things we're talking about, like the, the passion, having some reason for doing something. So I actually do have an objective, which is to get more people interested in, <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. So the message I usually tell people, it's, it's also a different twist on this. I usually tell people, like in our community and so on, it's very good if you can move away from the attitude of how do I get stuff for myself and move into the attitude of how do I create value in my situation I am right now. That's actually all I think about. That's why I do crazy things. Like sometimes I do stuff and it's unclear I'm getting anything out of it. It's because when I go around in the world, I'm just saying, how can I make the most value generated in this system here? Right? And I've done this through my whole life. And many times, you know, we get payback. But if you just keep running around saying, how do I make value out of this situation? By bringing together different people, by adding a new idea, by adding something I know, just add value. Don't worry about what comes back to you. This attitude, by the way, I actually think will get those people a lot farther, get people a lot farther. Because by the way, if you always want something, you know, on my way here, I flew here, I was sitting next to a net jets pilot, net jets, private jets, right? And that's when I learned that, you know, I didn't know how much those things cost. That's obviously all the bike price range. Okay, but what, 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 it, what it shows you is if you say, okay, I'm gonna be rich. Then you see the guy over there, he, has, he doesn't have a private propeller thing, he's a private jet. Oh, I want that too. Okay, you get that. But the guy was telling me about how there are these bigger and better ones and supersonic and whatever. And at some point when you got your private jet, which is the best one, you go find out someone else has an A380. What I'm trying to say is there's no end to that stuff, right? So, the, so what I've been doing, actually, if you look at this, uh, this extensive tour, I run around the country telling 
people about this kind of philosophy. So I'm basically trying to change this philosophy on a national scale. And I realized the easiest way to do that was to show up in their city and declare a talk. I started this after the pandemic because I've been giving talks before and I used to come to things like this, give a talk and like an audience like this. And then after the pandemic, I, I was so pent up, I really wanted to go out again. And I just decided to play the traveling salesperson problem, TSP, and just, uh, <laughs> just plot out path through the United States of America, declaring talk, 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 talk. And I, I go to places telling students, telling parents, all of that message. Again, this is just my style, but I think that the more people who say these things, the better, and I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, let's go over here. There was a question here waiting for a while. Yeah, I guess it's like a pretty difficult question, but like you talked about like a very like domain specific people who are like pretty interested in like math and like more advanced math and like competitive math. But I guess like, I think like perhaps a more challenging and big scale problem, which like, of course, like you know, it's hard to solve. I don't expect to have a solution, but like what happens to high school now when like chat GPT can like do high school? Like, uh, what high, high, school, school? high school just got completely broken. Yes. What do we do? Yes, high school did just get completely broken. So I spent enough time talking to actual teachers that I can see people are very worried. Just this morning, somebody asked me the question of what are we going to do? Because kids can use this to write their essays. Yeah. Actually, let me correct it. She said, kids are using this to write their essays. <laughs> uh, she was asking me, can you make a detector? I said, good luck. <laughs> I mean, you guys here who do computer science know the better detector you make, the more you never win that game, right? So actually, the solution that most people have seen to find to this is called uh, do homework, no, do, do, do evaluations in class, so write essays in class. I was giving a talk in New York City, and I was talking to seventh graders, I said, chat GPT, and they said, we hate chat GPT. I said, why? Everyone else thinks it's awesome. They said, because now we have to write essays with pencil. <laughs> I said, welcome back to the 1990s. <laughs> but so that's what happened, right? So in the 1990s, we did it. Is there, is there still, do you think there's like still a point for like teaching all this? Like, it's like another thing which I'm thinking about is like, okay, if this thing can do like what I'm learning or like what people are teaching, is it still worth teaching it? Okay. Like, now the question is, should we change all of the curriculum? Well, we got some people here who have been working on talking to people who, who change curriculum, right? It's, it's, it's very difficult to do something at that scale. So unfortunately, I have come to the conclusion that I, as a single person, will not be able to convince powerful people who control curriculum to change curriculum. So what I do is I make an out-of-band solution that is just better. And then at that point, people come into that, and we, that's why we have the researchers. Because the point is, once you have the researchers documenting it, then suddenly there might be a question. But if you just try to go in and say, you must change. Well, let me be very careful with what I said about better. It is not better, because there's also the problem that I said earlier, like, what if you have the classroom and people aren't going to try thinking? So what I mean by this is, we have a way of teaching that extra piece that you are saying is the missing part, which is true. And what will we do with the actual time that's in school? That one is a problem that I have not yet come up with a proof. Apollo song. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Yeah. Let me so go back. Teach the kids prompt engineering. Teach the kids prompt engineering. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, I will say though, when I go into a school, sometimes the people say, please be careful not to show them too much of what you can do with prompt engineering on GCT. Because there's a danger that anything can be used the other way. Okay, let me go back over to this side. There was I always try to go back and forth. So did you have a question? Yeah. How do you assess if like a given high school student is nice when you're ah, how do you assess if a given high school student is nice? We take advantage of the fact that most high school students haven't learned to be sophisticated liars yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so what I mean is that you, you know, by the way, there's like multiple stages. You write some stuff first. Okay, that could be done by chat GPT. But then at some point, then they have to send an audition video. So far, they haven't figured out how to deep take that one. But so they have to send an audition video of how they talk. Uh, you have some sense of like whether a person looks like they might be doing this because their mom said you need to do this to get on your college, right? The, the kids are not that sophisticated. And then finally, they get to the interview. The interview is with a couple of people, myself, somebody else who's a full time, and then also some high school students who are actually inside the program. Uh, by the way, they're very proud of the program. So they have to keep the standard high, if that makes sense. It's like, they, this is like their thing. We always like to give the younger generation the, the ownership, right? So the point is in a half hour interview, what we can figure out is, you know, maybe we'll have a false, we could have like some false positives, false negatives, but we are able to generally get a sense of whether or not you care about people. Like we ask those kinds of questions, just not always the same question. We don't say, do you care about people? Right? You, can, you, can, you can actually tell. And I want to emphasize, we take people who are quiet too. 
You don't have to be this like show person. No, there are plenty of quiet people who are wonderful. And those sometimes you, you can tell as you start talking to them. So, so this is a skill. This is a skill to interview for that. But then, then actually, before they even get into the teaching part of the program, they have to go and practice for a while. In fact, we don't put someone in front of a paid class. Paid class means that someone's paying for the class or that the scholarship donor is paying for the class. Does that make sense? Paid class means delivering the goods. We don't let them do that until they're checked out on like being able to do what you just saw here. They have to be at this level where I can go to anyone and say, this is the best live video map class you're ever going to see. That's actually what I said. And then we deliver it, okay? By the way, part of doing that class is you come across as a really nice person. So maybe someone can get past this by being such a good actor that they can even end up teaching a class to look empathetic and care about the other person. And at that point, okay. But the number of people who are high school who could get all that far is hard. Usually when I say nice, I also don't think people are fundamentally not nice. I just think that people haven't thought about that. I think a lot of middle schoolers are just like doing their thing. High schoolers, their parents told them to do this and that. And then there's a certain point of maturity when you say, you know what? I actually do care about other people. Hopefully. And so we're very open-minded. We just tell high school students, it's not that you're rejected forever. It's apply again next year. We'll see how things are. Right? And the other reason why we're doing this is it's building a new normal among the high school math community. We have some pretty good people who are inside our program, and they are well known. So, people, when I say they're well known, in this high school math community, it's a network. It's actually pretty small. People know each other, know each other, know each other. People know who's in our program. And there's a common characteristic the people in our program are like, they're pretty nice people. And now they're getting more successful. So we're trying to make it so that, you know, if you're in the high school math community, it's not just about being the best at doing math problems to get ahead. There's this other thing that could also be important. So this is all about social stuff, right? And that's why, that's why I go everywhere, because that's the only way that I could think of to spread the idea. More questions. I'll just keep going for a few more. Because we're... Oh, let me go to the front now. Yeah, right here. Yeah, so since a lot of people here are researchers, recently, I saw an interview of Antonio CEO of Fernandez. Next step, AGI, artificial general intelligence. And that will be the AIs could actually generate new research ideas and basically conduct research. With a lot of people who are researchers, I'm wondering about your take on that happens, like how reliable things will be, how it will affect the job perspectives of people here. Okay, so this is about like the, the artificial general intelligence taking over the jobs of people here. Uh, so I'll say this is definitely not my expertise. So I'll say there are other people here who know more. Um, I think I'll just say this is not usually what I worry about because the fraction of jobs in the world that are the jobs we are talking about right now is very small. So what I'm usually worrying about is what to do with everyone else, because if everyone else has no job, you might lose your job for another reason. Not that the AI took it, but that your job can't be sustained because people don't have the money to pay for it. So I'm, I'm saying like, I think this is a deep question and I'll leave it for the actual AI researchers to answer. Uh, I, I do think you're supposed to be the farthest away though. Isn't there some chart of the hardest jobs to remove? Those are the research ones. So yeah, I think the bigger issue is just I think, and actually I'm saying this on purpose because all of us are also living in this ecosystem. We're all pushing this ecosystem forward. And I do think it's valuable for us to also think, you know, what are the impacts of what we're making on, 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 on the rest of the world? And by the way, we're pretty clever people. You can come up with ways to mitigate or to, to assist with that. And interestingly enough, that might also help sustain your position. Maybe. We'll see. But again, this is not, this is not my main expertise. Is there anyone's question on this side? Otherwise, I'll go back to that side again. Okay. Do you see your idea like instead of like broadening instead of just math into like other general subjects? For example, like you could use your idea and use Khan Academy videos to put it like in stream. So how would you take the idea for okay. general? So you're asking how this idea, by the way, doesn't have to only teach math. It could generalize to all things. In that sense, I'm not a very good business person. I could. But what I'm actually trying to do here is I'm trying to help people learn how to think because I think that's good for them. I could sell more stuff. I don't care. What I think is more important is figure out how to teach as many people to do that thinking as possible. Like for many years, I've actually expressed one of my goals in life, which I don't think I'll achieve. But one of my goals would be if there could be that half of the population of this country 
can solve the first question on the second level high school math competition in the US in 24 hours. This is called the AIME. A -I -M -E. It is a math contest where you have a question where you, you don't need to know calculus, don't need to know trigonometry, but you need to really think outside the box to solve it. And actually the goal is, the goal I would have is if half the people could solve that very first question, which doesn't require any more, often doesn't even need high school algebra, in 24 hours, then we have people who can think, right? So my interest is not so much in selling physics classes as this. Now, what we are doing with it, though, we're not expanding out that way. We're expanding out in terms of countries. Because there's another goal here, which is to unite the world. Like, we, we actually intentionally are connecting people to join this program. Actually, I was in Romania last night, two months ago. And when I was there, I talked to high school students. And it turns out that the high school students from Romania, they want to join our high school students. They actually applied in. The incentives align really well. Actually, for them, they have additional incentives because for them, then they also get to connect with the US, uh, the US world, if that makes sense, which is also opportunities. So now our program actually has US and Romania. Now, the funny, the interesting thing is this could actually span a lot of people. And so I'm actually more interested in just teaching sixth graders how to come up with new ideas and how to think with only 120 hours of class or 200 hours of class. That's it. That's it. But with that 200 hours of class, if we could address all of the sixth graders in the world, then we did something. Okay. Uh, with that, I think, unfortunately, we hit the time. Yeah. So, nice to meet all of you. Yeah.